You guys, thank you so much for, for having us. Uh, again, my name is Patrick Oborn. This is Kobe Phillips. You'll be hearing more from him in a second. Um, Stefan, awesome presentation. Um, really appreciated the, the state of the industry. And, and when I looked at your slides, what I really appreciated is the time that it takes to get mass adoption. Uh, Tolaris, for those of you who don't know us, which is probably 100% of you, there are some people in the back. I know you guys know who we are. You actually work with us every day. Uh, we've been at this for 21 years. And I can tell you the first 10 years was very um, unremarkable, right? It was like watching a tree grow. It was, you know, get some customers, you know, listen to them, get a few more customers. And now we're a billion dollar company. We have 450 employees. We're in across four continents. So it's big. Technology distribution was, is, is a big thing, but it took us a while to figure it out and to make corrections and to work with our community and hear their feedback and get things where they wanted to be. Now, you guys are on a much more accelerated course. This is not going to take you guys 21 years. I'd be surprised if you guys aren't renting out like the whole entire MGM Grand in five years. So <clears throat> exciting things coming for you guys. One of the most important things I think that I took away from um, your speech, uh, Stefan, was create recurring revenue. revenue sources, all right? That's why we're here. <laughs> Look at us as your outsourced, because you guys are community, right? Everybody kind of takes their piece. We want to be your de facto sales team. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how we built Tolaris in, in, in just five second description. We sell a lot of stuff. We sell five million a month in MRR and infrastructure services, right? So that's a lot. Some of it's software as a service, some of it's infrastructure cloud as a service, some of it's network as a service, some of it's cybersecurity as a service. Everything as a service is what we specialize in. So I think we're, we're in the right place at the right time to uh, do some awesome work with each other. But just in case you're wondering who I am, I'm going to give you a five minute quick, just stay with me. This is the least technical part of your entire day. So just your brain's going to get a little bit of a rest. You kick back and just uh, hear the story. So this is me, uh, six years old. <clears throat> um, like, like none of you, I was told I would never be anything in life. Just go to school, figure out how to get through your classes, get yourself into a college somehow, get a job, <clears throat> get a 401k, call it good. That was the plan for me. But deep down in my heart, I knew that that was a horrible plan, that something, there had to be something more in life. And so um, I grew up in LA. When I was 13 years old, we moved to a new house. And our new house was awesome. And it was, had this big dirt yard. And then weeds started growing in it. And, and it took my parents a little bit of time because we kinda, they kind of went all in on the house. We didn't have any leftover for the landscaping. So we had to wait a couple years. You know, you guys, yeah, been there, done that, right? And so weed started to grow, and I went back to that backyard, and I looked, and I said, you know what? I don't see a backyard full of weeds. I see a bike track. I see a bike track that maybe people will pay to use. <laughs> so I set out with my uh, <clears throat> next-door neighbor and best friend, Adam Edwards. You'll be hearing more about him here in a second. And we made a bike track, and we said, you know what? We're going to monetize this bike track. We're going to charge five cents a lap. And we're going to tell as many people as we can about it and see how we do. So we did our first business. We went for a whole month, and we made 45 bucks. And I said, that's a lot of work. Because every day we had to maintain it. We, put, we added new stuff to it. We collaborated with people. We got their feedback. We built whoop de doos We built berms. We built this huge jump. That's me, by the way, like cruising over that. And that's my little brother, and that's my friend. Anyways, Adam's laying down on the ground, like taking the picture of me like jumping over him. Um, the next jump, I, I kind of came in hot, and I chipped my tooth, and it's still chipped to this day. But anyway, so we built that, and we said, you know what? Maybe there's a better way. Maybe if we find the cool kids at school, we were in junior high at the time, and we had <clears throat> them tell their friends about our thing, and we offered them a 20% cut. Maybe we could get more people to use our bike track. So we went to all of our cool kids' friends. We told them, hey, we'll keep track as best we can, and <clears throat> we'll cut you in on 20%. Of the, of the revenue. And they said, fine. So we went from barely people, anyone using our bike track to our bike track was full. We pulled in the next month 510 bucks. But we had to part with 102 of it. Uh, let me go back, sorry. <clears throat> had to part with 102, but we still netted 400 bucks. So we went from 45 bucks, we almost 10x our revenue by getting other people involved. <clears throat> and that's really my first experience with the referral model. 
How do we get more people to know about what we do and, and be interested and use it, most importantly? Um, fast forward, graduated high school. It was awesome. Went to college. Got some boring degree in computer engineering um, that I never use anymore. And <laughs> I could barely understand what you guys say. And I'm like going back like years. I'm like, come on, brain, technical brain, fire back up. We wrote a thesis, man. We used to be really smart. But what we, uh, we did is I got a, a job as a circuit designer. I was designing custom integrated circuits for communication satellites for space. I could tell you all about it, but I'd have to kill you because it's top secret. So uh, everyone knows, yay, defense contractors. So we, um, on the nights and weekends, I was really fascinated by this, this interwebs, by, by putting things on the line. I'm just kidding. The internet was, was really getting going. And we kind of faced a similar dilemma back then. We had all of this great content, and people were creating awesome websites that no one could find, that no one even knew to find, that no one even knew was there. And so we were basically, everyone's building mansions, but there was no roads, there was no maps, there was nothing. It was kind of like the Wild West, so to speak. I mean, the best we had literally was you go to Yahoo and submit your site there, and maybe they might list it there. So there was like literally, like it was like an car, online card catalog at a library. It was very boring, very plain. And then Google came on the scene, and said, you know what, we're going to index, you know what their, their mantra is? You guys know what it is? We're going to index all of the world's information, all of it. So very soon, Google came out, and then people started to be able to find websites. And so I said, wow, there's some incredibly powerful websites out here that no one's ever heard of because they're not listed in Google. And so I pulled down the Google patent. I read it. Basically, the Google patent is just a recipe book for how to game it, right? I mean, I want linkage. I want you know, the link juice. It describes how that works, A tags, um, uh, keyword density on your page. Like Everything's in the patent. <laughs> so I started doing some A-B testing of, of my own, writing some HTML code, and boom, I would see different things pop. And so I went to find people where I could be the referrer, where I could re-bring people to your website, but I wanted a 20% cut of anything they bought. Right? So I started cutting deals and got into what's called affiliate marketing. So that's kind of how I kind of married math and sales together so I could connect those, those website owners to the people that wanted and needed their products. So I, I started out, I started a website in 1997 called cheaprates.com. And this is me, I was 25 years old and I was writing my code and it was awesome. So I, cheaprates.com, the first thing that came to mind is cheap travel tickets, airfare, hotel, all that fun stuff. And I made five grand. I was so excited uh, that I could make five grand. I sold 51 grand, and, and, and my commission was five, so about a 10% commission. But then I started trying some other things. One plus long distance was a big thing, seeing how you get better long distance rates, calling cards, travel cards, all this stuff. So I, I created a new kind of area of my website for telecom services, and I sold half. So I sold 51 grand in airlines and hotels. I only sold 26 grand here, but I got $5,000 every month, and again, and again, and more cards went out the door, and that money just kept growing. And I thought, wow. So I learned the power of referral marketing. I learned the power of residuals, and that re monthly recurring, and how, how magic that was. So fast forward, we said, you know what, let's, going back to my, uh, my bike track days, grab my best friend Adam Edwards, who was out there with picks and shovels with me, and we both graduated from college, but he's in finance and business, I'm of course, um, online marketing, engineering, coding, that kind of thing. And I said, let's get together and let's start a company where we can create tools, where we can create a marketplace where businesses can come and purchase infrastructure services. So that's what we did. We, in 2002, we started Telaris. Um, this was our first product. This is called GeoQuote. Because what, what, what ended up happening is we would, go, we would go out and we would create all these websites where where people would go looking for pricing. They would, availability, is internet available here? Well, I need a T1. Anyone know, remember what a T1 was? You guys have, most of you too young. Some of you, not so much. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we were selling lots of T1s, and so we created a system. All these deals were coming to us, and we tried to close them. We were closing around $5,000 a month in new sales, which was cool, which, again, enabled $1,000. But then we started working with more and more people, more and more webmasters, everything else. And instantly, we went from, I, I swear, we gamed Google so hard. One day, Adam came into my office. I don't know if you guys have ever had a day like this, where it's like, things are going so good. He's like, are we going to get arrested? I'm like, I think it's legal. Because like, you would Google T1. And we were pages 1 through 10, 11 through 20, 
again, all the way to 50. And then Verizon and AT&T and those guys were way below us. I'm like, this can't stand for long. Because what we did is we would create pages that pseudo-randomizes themselves. We set up uh, websites across multiple web hosts. So we have multiple IP addresses on each site. So each site was uniquely owned, unique IP address, unique content. But all the APIs came back into our system. So it was a really cool, I mean, yeah, man, we found a system and we gamed the freaking crap out of it until we got shut down. So it was awesome. But what happened is we had so many leads coming in, we had to go basically recruit a sales force. 1099 guys, come in here, we're gonna give you leads, you close them, and you get residuals and we'll split the residuals 50-50 with you. And they said all day long. So we went from doing work on our own to bringing all these indirect partners. And we're, we're gonna talk about these partners in a second. We instantly, almost in two months, went to 100,000 in MRR per month in sales, just from this one online uh, web initiative. So, so we went from generating $1,000 in profit. Now again, they're doing all the work. All we're doing is managing them now at this point, managing them, coaching them, helping them with their marketing, helping them with their pitch, bringing in new suppliers that, that maybe we had a product hole. Maybe in New Jersey we had like terrible prices, so we need to bring in someone who has a good footprint in New Jersey. So that was really the thing that we started doing. We started managing supplier relationships. We started managing the sales force. And we started wrapping all this value around the sales force so they had everything they needed. We called it sales agency in a box. And so that's really how we got started. So again, going from 1000 a month to 4000 a month in net margin. So that is really how, how things went. So just like our company has gone in phases, just like you guys are going in phases, from a technology perspective, the, the sales model, it, it also follows a very similar evolution. Whenever a new technology is created, there's always, let's create the tech, let's bring in some, instead of angel investors, let's bring in some angel customers, right? Some very cutting edge customers that are willing to like, you know, let us stub our toe a little bit, give us feedback. If we make a mistake, it's okay because it's not mission critical stuff, right? These are your very, very early phase customers. And when you look at them on the chain, they're right over here. They're your innovators, okay? And we've already been through that phase here. You guys check that box. You guys are doing awesome. Typically, the next phase is then you have the VAR ISV. You have people that come in, and they take your raw product, and they start wrapping service um, guarantees around it. They, they write some of their own code. They actually sit down with the customer and write code on their side to help build the APIs and build the bridges to the product. And so these people are very technical in nature, but they, they add value, and they really help you expand your reach into getting into more and more relationships. And we call this kind of phase two, the VAR phase. This is what happened in phone systems. This is what happened in SaaS. This is what happened in almost, almost every technical industry goes through this phase. Then we kind of evolved to the next phase, which is the, um, and of course you've got the innovators now, the VARs are coming in, they're doing a little more work, they're billing customers, they're providing customer service. Then you get to the managed services phase. And this is a really cool phase. This is where your channel really starts to evolve. And this is really where I see us right now here in this room is we're in the managed services phase where a company comes in and says, this is great. You guys are doing all this great work. And it was so fun to see like Intel in the room and, and to hear the words Intel and, and open source like in the same conversation, I was like blown away. Because back when I was in college, Intel and open source, <laughs> no way. Would you ever hear that? So it's really cool to see the community come together, both on the hardware side, um, on the software side, and, and it's, 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 it's literally amazing what you guys are building, and I have no doubt in your future. But they can also bring in some Web 2 things that the customer might also need. So it's really kind of creating this all-in-one experience for the customer so that they can buy all of, all of these things and make it feel to the customer like it's basically just another branch, just another type of file storage. And that's where we are now, and this is awesome. And this is what a lot of people typically refer to as the channel. We're building our channel, we're getting MDF funds for our channel, for these guys right here, to make sure that they can go out and they can have uh, marketing events, they can advertise, they do everything else. So this is kind of, I think, where, where we're at now, and I think this might be not the limit of your understanding, but maybe the limit of your experience. So now I'm going to introduce you to some new stuff. So this is, you know, perk right up. Like, let me see your, your eyeballs. All right, this is the new stuff that you guys are really going to like. So again, we're, help, we're, we're going up the curve, but you know what? There's a lot of juiciness right here in the early majority. It's like, how do we get to there? There is so much money, so much revenue. 
uh, so much opportunity that sits right here, but we got to bust into that phase. And, and this, again, isn't the only solution. I think you're still going to see a combination of, of VARs. You're going to see a combination of MSPs. You're going to see a combination of people who work with you directly. But this is the fourth and, and final phase. And this is called the channel of channel. Right? So now there's, if you take that thing and you break it apart, there's, we've always seen that there's kind of a gap. Okay, this is where companies in my field fill that gap. Now, who are we and what do we do? And that's an awesome question. So you see there's this word called TSD. That stands for Technology Services Distributor. So what we do is we contract with your MSPs, who we call suppliers. Call them suppliers because they're Vantage Services suppliers, right? They're providing that service to end clients. So we contact with multiple of them. In fact, we've got some of them in the room. If you're a Telaris supplier, please raise your hand. Okay, right here in the back. That's a laser point, you guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> right? We have several of them. And what we've done is we've gone out and we've created through our, our, our sales force, which is create called channel managers, we're recruiters. We're recruiting 1099 salespeople all over the globe. We're bringing them from direct sales, from, from AT&T and Verizon, bringing them in. We're bringing them in from data centers, bringing them in. And we're teaching them how to be business owners. So they can go in. They can run their own P&L. They can go in and, and hire and fire and have HR help. We give them financing options so they can run their business and invest. And we make sure they have everything they need so they can focus on one thing and one thing only. And that's selling. Right? They don't even have to have a technical background or engineering background. Why? Because we have 16 certified engineers. We've got Amazon certifications. We've got, we've got uh, security certifications. We, I mean, Kobe will talk about this in a second. But we have so much expertise that they can check out like a library book, get in an opportunity, and then give it back to us without, without us charging them for those things. So, so these people here, there's a community of 4,100 people across the world that we support. So our 400 employees, all we do is support these guys. So we, we, we never touch the end user, okay? These guys are friends with the end user. Now, this is where things get really exciting because those 4,000 people have penetrated 90 of the Fortune 100. Now, how do they penetrate them? Sometimes they cold call in, sometimes they network in, and sometimes the CIO of some big company was their college roommate in their, in their class or whatever. It does, to us, it doesn't matter. All we care is that they have a relationship with that person. And that human relationship, you guys are talking about you know, networking and data and how everything connects. We really focus on how humans connect. Because on an enterprise scale, technology gets purchased in a human way. Because there's so many options out there, these people are confused. Okay? And the, the kind of decisions that they're forced to make are career impacting. If they choose the wrong one of these, these guys have to go uh, update their LinkedIn profile very dang quick. Right? And, it, and it's bad. So it's not just like, I'm not going to get a promotion or blah, blah. These people are very, they're not running scared, but they're very conservative. They're very cautious. And their trust levels run low. And so when they meet someone they know and they've known for 20 years, that trust level is high, and that's why another alternative word for these guys from technology advisors is trusted advisors. And so those two terms are analogous in our business, but they all work with us because they re re uh, rely on us having contracts with these guys. The contracts that we have ensure that they get paid on a monthly residual basis. We have attorneys to make sure the contracts are enforced. We have engineers to make sure we understand all of their service offerings to a certain level so that we can help them decide on which one of these to go with in a certain situation. And at the end of the day, these guys sign up with your managed service provider tied into you. And so there's now two more links in the chain. The chain feels like it's getting really long right now. But honestly, the bigger the chain gets, the more reach we collectively have. And so this whole world now is, is basically your, your cavalry of, of 4,000 sales reps just showed up to uh, help us out here. So it's a very exciting time um, to help us get to that uh, early majority. And <clears throat> I, I kind of went over this a little bit. Like, what, what else do we do? Uh, we have advanced solutions groups. And what an advanced solution group is, is basically we've categorized all the areas of technology that our customers need. 
every single business, every single enterprise out there, they have network needs. They have unified communication needs. Most of them have some type of contact center needs, where it's an internal help desk, or it's an external help desk, or it's a sales desk, or whatever else. They have security needs, obviously, um, and cloud and, and, and a data infrastructure, which is really our fastest growing area of all of these. And then a lot more people are looking to get more information with IoT devices and, and, and mobility. So all of these areas are growing really fast. <clears throat> what Telaris has done is we, we call these practices. What we've done is we've hired practice leaders that manage each one of these areas. They're compensated based on <clears throat> the growth of their particular area. They're also um, um, ensure that we have the providers we need to compete in each of those areas. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus down on our cloud vertical right here. And this man that you're going to meet right now, Kobe Phillips, is the person that heads up that area. So Kobe, if you give him a round of applause real fast, come up on stage with me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Why don't you stand right over there, man? Welcome to the spotlight. I learned something new about you today. I didn't know, I didn't know the dirt track You didn't story. know the dirt so, track. Yeah. These teeth don't get chipped for nothing, man. Like we, we put our heart and soul into that. No, so, so being an entrepreneur, seeing something kind of before other people and then really willing it to happen, it's kind of a, 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 a talent I have. But my partner, Adam Edwards, he's the guy that can take those ideas and turn them into commercially viable entities. Because <laughs> I started several of, you know, startups and stuff before I actually partnered with him that didn't really go anywhere. We had the best ideas, we had the best technology, we had all these cool website ideas that we built, but it never really went anywhere because we had to marry the commercial side of it with the idea side, and, and, and it's not lost on me how important that is. <clears throat> and Kobe, um, you have pretty extensive background. You, you, you worked at Equinix, uh, yep. dealing with some of the largest customers. Tell us a little bit about just your history real fast. Yeah, so I uh, started off actually network. So understanding how the connectivity drives all of the technology and things like that at level three. Uh, graduated through that. Uh, came to work with you guys, right? Um, yep. Started pushing this, this idea of channel throughout, which has been established. If you think about our channel, we make up about 20% of revenue for some of the largest companies in the world, like AT&T, like Lumen, like Comcast. And that Comcast used to be single and, digits not right? that long ago. I mean, this is but accelerating you, fast. Yeah, but if you see the connection, right? Those are yeah. all telco, we're, we're a telco-based channel. Now, um, what I really got excited about is all the expansion of the technology that we started to be able to offer. And uh, in my time is opening up uh, like one of our, our right regions, here. the West region was my responsibility, and we grew it. Right? Um, I got promoted into some management roles, and I said, hey, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Adam. I really appreciate the promotion. I quit. Uh, and I left, and I went to Equinix. That's a true a story, by the way. Um, Equinix offered a really unique platform. There was so much cool technology happening within those four walls of those data centers. And I'd sat there, and I was like, I knew, I, I knew that I was going to go learn way more about the broader scale of tech if I got outside and, and, and was able to absorb that. So I went um, and then returned, I think, about 18 months later, right? Not very long, I wasn't gone long. We called it a sabbatical. And we started to launch our cloud practice. Now, the cloud in our channel is historically legacy infrastructure, data center, that kind of stuff. But what we've seen in the last 36 months as we built this out is an explosion of new tech that's available to this ecosystem of partners. And we'll talk a little bit more about like what it takes to bridge the gap of awareness and knowledge and how to get production out of our channel as new technology emerges through it. Like this is, as I've set and I've learned and I've studied everything that's happening here, there's some really quick avenues of conversations to happen. And then how do we pull that through and get it distributed out? Yeah, so one of the main things that we do with our sales team is we teach them not how the tech works necessarily. What we like to teach them is what's the use case for that tech? And then what associated questions do you ask that customer so you can make money? Like our people don't care about solving technical issues, they care about sales, and that's it. They're, they're coin operated. And so Kobe has gone through and created an entire two-day university where we actually fly people in. Kobe goes around, you just got back from Canada yesterday where you were, were hosting one of these uh, trainings, and you get into a lot of detail of, yeah. of, but what's in it for me? How does this gonna help my customer? What is the use case? And so that's really what, what we're interested in. But Kobe, just from um, what you've seen so far, what are the best Filecoin use cases that you're going to talk to our channel? And what are the opportunities that are there for our Because right now, we, we make zero commission off Filecoin technology. But we're 
we're headed in that direction. We want to we want to leverage you guys as a huge money maker for us. So we're we're uh, we're in it together. We have a mutual interest. Talk a little bit about the opportunity. Yeah, I would say the biggest opportunity. If you look at the core root of where our whole channel originated, right? It was around the telco stuff so or long distance, and it was yeah. like. How can I help cost reduction for companies? How can I start to optimize cost across the plane? That's one of the major components of what's going on here with data storage, right? And if you look at every major uh, analyst outlet, Gartner, Forcer, it's continually number one. If cost optimization is the number one thing that people are driving towards with their existing cloud strategy, understanding that. And what's one of the biggest overlooked areas of that? Storage. Right? It's not something that people look at and go, how can I save more money on my storage? There's not a lot of that conversation. It's, am I using the right instances? Do I, do I need to lower my egress charges? Do I need to go from all public cloud to use in a hybrid so I can um, load balance and then lower my cost and spread it, spread it out a little bit different? There's a lot of different concepts. Storage isn't one that generally gets talked about. I think that's a huge opportunity. And when you put it and you drop that into a core group of, of sellers, that have historically know how to go have that conversation and introduce the idea of cost reduction, cost optimization, and you bring that in, and then you bring in the right resources from our engineering team and our partners to explain it, and I think it's a really good winning formula. And we've seen it be successful time over time as new technology emerges. Here's the great thing about our story. We're not up here like, like hyping it up. We're gonna go out and get all these customers for you. We already have the customers. We've already sold them AWS. We've already sold them Colo, Rackspace Power, we've already sold them stuff. Like, they listen to us, they trust us. They've been with many of our advisors for, for two, two decades. And so it's, it, it's really cool, and you know, not to steal the thunder, but what, what other advantages do these guys have where like a, like a standard you know, Salesforce out knocking doors, pounding the phones, whatever? Well, you gotta think about it. Um, look at the major consulting firms, and, I, and um, KPMG, Accenture, Deloitte, they take it generally, they take somebody you know, relatively fresh out of college or young in their career. Yeah. They teach them how to have business conversations, teach them how to build business solutions, and then they teach them how to be an expert facilitator and bring in the right resources at the right time. This is a small so expert, expert yeah. facilitators yeah. is kind of If you think calling. about okay. what you just showed, right, all those plans of technology, this is a small conversation across a bunch of small conversations within one single client. So you start to see there's different layers within our partner group. You have transactional, transitional, and transformational, right? And the guys that are like shifting towards that transformational type of consulting firm, and we're seeing more and more of that, you're seeing an explosion of different products being sold. And this will definitely fit into that conversation because everybody's starting to adopt that one thing. They're not going in and they're not saying, hey, let me solve your data storage problem. They're like, what are your goals? What are your business needs? And then they start to break that down. This will be just another tool that they'll be able to utilize. It's kind of goes back to, I think, I'm going to accredit this quote to Elon Musk, right? Uh-oh. You get paid for the problems you solve. Yeah. So if you go in and you solve That's a good one. one problem, then you're going to get paid to solve that one problem. But if you go in and solve 20 problems or 25 problems, you now are getting paid a lot more money and that customer gets a lot stickier. This fits greatly into that conversation of how to solve those problems and really give them a, a net cost benefit, but also put them into all of the other benefits that that brings to bear, right? You have the um, disaster recovery kind of built in, the, reco the, the ransomware, ransomware, all yeah. of those things that, that are holding customers hostage, literally in this building, um, <laughs> like you have all of those components like happening. So yeah. that's, as you get the benefit across the board, it, it becomes a, a no brainer type of conversation to have. In those conversations, a lot of people are, are moving from, from one kind of area they feel pretty confident in into, into storage, which maybe they don't have a lot of experience. Through your trainings, through all your efforts, what kind of uptake have you experienced in your, in your practice? So, I mean, again, focus drives results, right? So when I came back, um, we didn't have a cloud focus in the organization. Our, a couple of our competitors did. Um, but there wasn't a huge ad adoption rate in our, again, telco was really the background. But if you go to that, that slide, I love that slide with the, the innovation and the, the adopters. We are a consumer driven channel. We don't sell anything until the customers, if you're all based on relationships and you're bringing in bleeding edge technology and you make your customers bleed, that's not great for your relationships sometimes. <laughs> right. But as customers start to adopt more and more, you just see everything spike. So that early majority, that late majority is where we dominate, and that mid-market to small enterprise section 
is where we really see a lot of growth and return. We have, we've sold into probably every Fortune 100 company, but definitely 90 of them, right, that I looked up personally to show the scale. But what I will tell you is what we're seeing as far as adoption rates and growth, we had, and I'll just give real numbers here. We had eight selling partners in cloud in 2019. Uh, we're, in the, we're well past in the hundreds now, and we're seeing more revenue generated in a single month than we did in single years uh, before we started the practice. So what that tells me, and the, here's, the, here's the other scary part about that. What we have selling on a monthly average is less than 10% of what we're selling as an entire organization, right? So that shows how much more greenfield there is in this community as we're driving adoption. So there's tons of room left to grow. And so you're seeing a, a, a lot of return on an effort. Now, the biggest change that we did is if we sat here and try to explain everything that you guys know to any of these guys, it's probably gonna be overwhelming. So we, we go and we, we shift from what it is and why it matters. We definitely cover that. That's great. But we more yeah. position, how do you sell it? How do you position it and why, like, how do you drive through the sales experience? So if you think about what, what our organization brings to an organization like what, what you guys have, if you think about, there's a, there's a book called The Challenger Cell. There's four major components that drive customer loyalty, right? 20% uh, of that is company and brand, 18% of that is products and services, 9% is price, 53%, somebody wants to check the math on this just 53%. in case, 53% is sales experience. It's the presenter. Bringing it's everybody people. together. It's yeah. the whole experience. It's like going to Disneyland and wow, that ride was great. And so, buy, yeah. buying technology, it's, it's, it's a ride, it's well, an experience. And if you think, take another bigger step back, and you, there's a slide that I always use in a lot of my presentations. It shows a pie chart. It shows all of these things that are on an, an, an IT executive's desk, a VP and above, right? And there's IT automation, there's security, there's, there's platform, all, six major components in, in monitoring, in process, in deployment, and then on the scope. And there's hundreds of little bubbles. And the size of the bubbles, the impact of the organization, and the colors of the difficult scale, when you show that to a room full of executives, because I get to sit down and do executive roundtables quite a bit, yep. I'm like, is this your world? They go, yeah. So then it's an awareness and an education thing, and that's another area that our channel has a really big impact on. And we bring the guys that have the relationships, and they say, they don't need to be an expert. They go, hey, have you, have you checked out like, this, this new yeah. data storage like, play? And they'll go, no. It's like, let me, grab, let me grab my guys, and let's have a conversation around it. And off they go. So Kobe, last question. Um, what, what do we need from them so that we can endow and empower, arm our people to go to battle to sell more file cutting based services? I would say very quickly, the three biggest net business benefits, right? The technology benefits are, are going to go over a lot of people's heads. Sounds like a gen yeah. question. And, but like, yeah, give me the three net Marketing. business benefits that are going to drive the conversation yeah. where somebody that was a washed out college athlete that can absorb it and grab it. Yeah, I'm not talking, talking about, about you, I was talking about me. Talk, um, we're both washed out college yeah, athletes, so, just by the way. Um, <laughs> where I can go, okay, that makes enough sense, let me go have the conversation. Yeah, yeah. And then that's where we step in. We educate our teams on, here are the, bigger, the big three components, here's the conversation, here's the talk track, here's your exit strategy to get out before you get too into the weeds, and then we'll get the right resources involved. So use cases, talk tracks, yeah. benefits, features, like, Okay, so that's what we need from you guys. So as you continue to innovate and build your roadmaps, understand where you are now so that we can talk about those things now. Tell us what's coming so we can maybe soften the battlefield for you later on so when those things do launch, we can hit the ground running with them. And uh, last but not least, uh, take care of our managed services providers. Like, that's our connectivity to you guys. So anything they need or, or, or suggestions, a lot of those suggestions are, are funneling up through us from the guys on the front line. So. Uh, keep in contact with them and keep up the good work. You guys are doing uh, amazing things. I'm a believer. Um, I'm a Filecoin owner. Like, <laughs> I'm, like you guys are, are incredible. So if uh, next steps, if you want to get in, in contact with us, um, we've got our emails here. You can take a picture. Just, just shoot us an email. We'd love to communicate with you, coordinate with you, and uh, give you our feedback. But thanks again uh, for yes. the very kind. I'm also very aware my headshot's a bit outdated with the haircut. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So The big um, look looks good though. No, yeah, dude. I, I just feel like I'm trying to hold on to something that's not there anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no worries. But thank you guys so much. You guys have been great. 
Um, Kobe and I will be here for the rest of the day, so if you want to find us on a break, come find us. So thank you very much, Jen, Stefan. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, guys. Thank you.